anyway, okay, well then let me, uh, let me just very quickly introduce uh, this panel. Um, yesterday, uh, there was some talk about whether particular things did or didn't happen in the actual world, you know, that there, things are anecdotes and so forth. One observation to make is that when you're an artist or a writer, everything is anecdote, and that's what we do. I mean, from our experience, you know, we, we are dealing in, uh, this is a, one of the interesting things about the intersection between law and, and the arts, is that we are precisely doing individual work in, in our ateliers, and we are not doing, you know, we're not thinking of ourselves as, as doing a type of thing, but rather a par particular thing. And, uh, and so, but having said that, strange things happen and difficult things, and especially in the world of copyright, confounding things. And so I thought I would start uh, today by a, an interesting uh, interaction, which is represented by something that happened between Joy Garnett and Susan Mizellis a while back, and maybe Joy can start, and then Susan, and then we'll go on to Levius Wood. But first, Joy Garnett is a painter, and here she is with her story. Thank you. Thank you. Um, this is a funny story um, called Molotov, um, which is the title of a painting that I made. Um, and <coughs> its source image, which is part of a photograph that Susan Mizellis took. And um, it's a story about our very different attitudes toward authorship and control. But mostly it's a story about internet culture and how a network community of total strangers took this story completely out of our hands. Um, a little background, I'm a painter, but all of my paintings are based on photographs that I find, um, mostly on the internet these days. Um, they're documentary in nature, and they range from science photography to declassified government images to journalistic images, photographs. And, um, but mainly, I freely uh, quote um, portions of the content of these photographs, and I do so without asking permission of their authors. Um, painting is a discourse. Um, throughout history, artists have um, referenced each other directly and the world around them and critiqued their society through their work. Um, and throughout this discourse, there have been different kinds of copying, sampling, appropriation, whatever you want to call it, but the history of art is about building upon previous works. And the history of art is really the history of, of remixing, of, of copying, of different kinds of copying, transformative or whatever. Um, at some point, photography entered this discourse. And at some point, painters started referencing photographs in their paintings. And there is a long lineup of such painters. But I'll, I'll just mention three who were important to me personally. Um, Andy Warhol, of course. Um, Leon Golub, who single-handedly painted his way through the Vietnam War and other conflicts um, through the use of found newspaper images and journalistic photography, and um, he states he stated in various interviews how crucial that was to his process, um, how he tapped into the world through the media. And Gerhard Richter, the German painter, whose entire of is investigates our relationship to photography and painting's relationship to photography. Um, in the spring of 2003, right after we invaded Iraq, I was feeling very confrontational. And I embarked on a new project that had to do with a figure. Um, and I um, eventually called it Riot. But generally, I sought out images um, on, online um, that uh, of, of figures in extreme emotional or physical states. And uh, when I found images that were interesting, I saved them on, I, this is what I do, I save them in a directory on my desktop and I let them sit for a while so I can forget about where they came from. Um, eventually, I look through these images and some of them jump out at me. And I, I want those, I want my choices to be based on more on aesthetic decisions than on my emotional attachment, say, to their source or whatever. Um, this guy jumped out at me. This guy still jumps out at me. Um, and in the summer of 2003, I decided um, to, 
to bite the bullet and start these paintings, and he was actually the subject of the first painting of this series um, of riot paintings, and uh, he was kind of big, 70 inches tall, and he was okay, and I put him away, and I continued to make more, um, um, based on figures from skinheads to demonstrators, rioters, airmen coming or leaving, hard to know, punk rockers. It was kind of a widespread people in extreme emotional states. Um, and like most artists these days, I uploaded images of my work to my website. Um, in January of 2004, I was offered a solo show of about 11 of these paintings, and we called it Riot, and this was in a gallery in Chelsea that no longer exists, but anyway, it was fun while it lasted, um, and these guys who ran this gallery decided that this image, this painting, was, was emblematic of, of the show, of the idea of the show, so they chose it. Um, we agreed um, that it should be the announcement card. So the announcement card went out with his image on it. And um, partway through the exhibition, I received um, an email from an acquaintance who had received, who's on my mailing list, who received the card, and he said, this image is from um, a photograph by Susan Mizellis. Is she aware of your use? And um, if not, are you going to ask her permission? So I didn't know what he was talking about until he sent me the URL to the Magnum Photo Agency site where you can see the original image and where you can see many images by um, Magnum photographers, uh, including Susan. And um, I was fascinated. Um, this is a really different image from what I projected onto the fragment that I'd found. Um, this is a San Sandinista. Uh, this is part of her lengthy photo essay on the revolution and a book um, that was published in 1981 but I will let Susan talk about her work. Um, anyway, it didn't make any difference to me other than that, that I was fascinated um, in terms of permission, um, until I received, about a week after my show came down, a cease and desist letter from Susan's counsel, um, telling me that I had infringed upon her copyright and that I was actually guilty of piracy, and that would I please take the images of my painting off my site and there were a number of other um, requests, demands. And I was extremely, um, well, I was flipped out, to say the least, and um, I immediately made an appointment with a lawyer, having never done that before. Never done that, never dealt with a lawyer before. Um, so that in and of itself was kind of scary. But I also went online to my um, online discussion group at a, at a place called Rhizome, a virtual place called Rhizome, which is a nonprofit organization that offers a platform for new media artists, meaning digital artists, artists whose um, creativity depends on new technologies, um, online technologies. And they discuss this kind of thing and the copyright controversies continuously. Um, and in fact, that week we had been discussing the Grey Album. So it was, it was just sort of seemed like something to do to open my cease and desist op to open it to discussion. Um, I didn't name names, and I, because I didn't name names, because I was totally paranoid, I did not give them the link to Susan's image. So we were just talking about my image and my thoughts. But they're a pretty contentious group, and I figured if there was going to be argument, this would be the place to have it. Once at my lawyer's, uh, my previously vague, um, kind of instinctual ideas about what fair use is, um, those ideas were fleshed out and actually bolstered and um, in various ways and I, it was really a crash course and I took notes. It was basically a course, um, a class. And um, I believe, I believe then and I think it, I would suggest now that the best way um, to deal with these issues because people have concerns and their concerns are valid and they are in conflict on all different sides of this issue. And probably compromise is not a bad thing, but you know, depending on the individuals involved. So I was willing to compromise um, and, and give in to some requests, but not to others. But my, my, my offer was refused. Um, and the response to my 
compromise was, was strong. It was intimidating. I decided I didn't need this. So I took the images off my website and I mentioned it to my online discussion group and who I had kept updated throughout. And then something really strange happened, something interesting. An artist named Tim took the cache of my website with the image of Molotov on it and he copied it and uploaded it to his website, creating a mirror. Mirror sites are a convention in internet culture. If a website is um, at risk or on the fringes of legality and people feel they want to preserve its content in case, in case it's shut down either by the government or by cease and desist, the takedown notice, people mirror the contents of, different, of those websites on other servers. Um, it's sort of a, a convention. Um, Anyway, other artists started making derivative work based on Molotovs, and someone actually declared a war, um, and people started making Agitprop based on my image. Um, and it went on, and a guy, an artist in England, decided to create a solidarity website with links to all the different, or some of the different um, Agitprop, and um, encouraged people to grab it and make art. Um, it started going up on all kinds of websites. Um, there's splash, oops, splash pages. Um, but when it hit the blogs, when it hit the blogosphere, that was it. it there was a ripple effect. Uh, it just spread virally. Um, the story, which was encapsulated um, in a particular way, just went out there. Um, and this is Carrie McLaren's site, who I didn't know then. We put the story on her site. Um, it was, it went global. It was translated into various languages, including Czech here, and rather mistranslated by the Italians, who were absolutely certain that the evil Pepsi was suing me. Okay, and that was interesting. It was, and revealing. This is something a corporation might do. Well, they didn't. Anyway, I show you just a few of the more interesting ones and the more mind-boggling ones. And people kind of went crazy. I don't know. <laughs> and this is my favorite. These are just stills from a shockwave animation that I couldn't quite get together to import, but. All right, my la <laughs> the last slide is interesting though because it's a blog post with the tagline, with the title, who owns the rights to this man's struggle? And to me, there are a number of questions. He asks one question. He asks, does the author of a, f of a, of a documentary photograph have the right to control all the content all the time? Uh, have the right to control, should they control who comments on the content and how, okay? But there's another question, which is, can they? And with that, um, I give the floor over to Susan, okay? Thank you. <laughs>